I'm out here in Apalachicola National Forest in Florida, which is one of the largest tracts of longleaf pine ecosystem remaining anywhere on Earth. Today, we're in for a really special treat. I'm joining herpetologist Pearson Hill to see a species that perfectly encapsulates the relationship between fire, wetlands, and longleaf pine ecosystems. Pearson, hold up, man. Dude, it's hot, it's humid, bugs are biting. Let's, let's cut to the chase. What are we doing? Where are we going? So this is what we call a dome swamp. And it gets its name from the dome-like structure created by the cypress and gum trees that grow throughout its basin. Because the tallest trees grow in the middle, deepest part, the shorter trees go on the outside. Oh, okay, so it's it shaped a, like a, shaped I, like a I dome got you. I got silhouette. You. How does this tie into the greater longleaf pine ecosystem? Is this like a separate entity in and of itself or? It very much is. So this is an embedded isolated wetland. One of the key features of these uh, dome swamps or these isolated wetlands is that many of them are ephemeral. And that means they uh, fill up and go dry at different times of the year, depending on rainfall. Well, that's not good, because what about all the animals that live in the water? So one of the key features of ephemeral wetlands is that they go dry and therefore they kill fish. And therefore they serve as excellent breeding sites for amphibians that hmm. don't do well around fish. Okay, well, like what? Peter, what we have here is a huge adult female Holy frosted crap. flatwood salamander. That is absolutely gorgeous. And this is a huge one. This is the biggest one I've ever seen. How does this kind of fit into salamanders in general? Like, is this part of a certain group? Yeah, so uh, the genus Ambistema, um, this is Ambistema cingulatum. Um, they're collectively known as the mole salamanders because they spend most of their time living underground. What a life. So, okay, is this camouflage? You said they're in the ground. Why is it looking like this? Their color probably doesn't do a whole lot for them, um, given that, yeah, they're underground 99% of the time, and when they're above ground, they're out at night. And so we don't think there's a whole lot of um, adaptive purpose to their coloration. It just makes nerds but. like us get really excited, I guess. That's <laughs> really what they're, what they're all about. What do they do all the time? I've never seen So them. most of the year, these guys live in the longleaf pine wiregrass uplands, like we have behind us here, um, where they choose crayfish burrows, stump holes, mammal burrows, and there they just kind of sit and hang out um, and occasionally snack on an earthworm or maybe um, other small insects. Wow. And they just wait for uh, winter rainfall to come. So October, November, when we get cold fronts and rain, they come up out of the ground and they march down slope into these breeding ponds where they congregate mate and lay eggs. Hold on, these things march? Look at those legs though. This, Pearson, these things do not march. They can move several hundred meters in a night. So they really so turn on their jets when the time is right. They come into the ponds, the males and the females, um, they converge, uh, they find these really nice lush areas of vegetation like we're sitting in right here, and uh, the males actively court the females. They'll rub their tails over her head, and um, it, she becomes receptive. I'm gonna try that. <laughs> if he does his dance right, she becomes receptive and then he'll put a spermatophore, which is a like plug of sperm um, that he sets down on the dry floor basin of the pond and she picks it up and uses it to fertilize her eggs. A female is picking up packets of sperm to fertilize her eggs. I'm picking, picturing her just walking around with like a little basket or something. What, what is she doing exactly? How is she, she picks up with her mouth? With she her... sits on it. So they have uh, what's called a cloaca, an all-purpose opening at the base of their tail. And um, so yeah, she'll just pick it up uh, off the ground and uh, there she, she keeps it. And then as she lays eggs, she uses it to fertilize. Wow, that's actually really interesting. So he's basically just like a little sausage that breeds. What about this brings them out here? This salamander does a very strange thing that none of its relatives do. Um, it lays its eggs in the dry pond basins and the eggs just sit on the ground and wait for rain to fill the pond up. And once water inundates those eggs, the embryos hatch out of the eggs within an hour and turn into free swimming aquatic larvae that live in the aquatic so environment. They're not they're, so they're moving when it rains, but they're not moving when there's even water here? They That's just right. hope that there's water? That's right. What if it doesn't rain? Then they need biologists to come to the rescue. Biologists like you, Pearson saving the day. <laughs> so I get that the flags are marking something, but was the pink 
your choice, Pearson? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we want to be able to return to this exact site next year because we think the females return to the same spot to lay their eggs. So we want high visibility markers so we can find this uh, six months from now. So what, what is this exactly? This is a nesting site for the flatwood salamander. They lay their eggs in small clusters, but they lay a bunch of clusters. And so all these flags surrounding us are from a single female. Wow. And I gotta be real with you. I mean, I've been looking down here. This is just a mat of thick interconnected vegetation. How the heck do you find these things when you're out looking for them? I mean, this is impossible. That's right. Well, we spend hundreds of hours uh, on our hands and knees um, searching this vegetation. Um, but the unfortunate fact is most of the ponds we look in have so little of this left that it doesn't take long to exhaust the possibilities of where eggs may be. How is this working in terms of laying their eggs? The eggs are very vulnerable to desiccation or drying out um, if it gets too hot, too dry, or even too cold. And so these grasses actually cap in um, humidity and protect the eggs. Wow, that's so it's not just hiding from predators, it's like a little bubble. It's like a bubble within a bubble. That That's right. In. There's actually no soil underneath the plants. Once you dig down past the living plants, you hit wet clay. So there's no developed organic layer. There's no uh, muck layer, peat layer underneath this vegetation. And the salamanders actually lay their eggs directly on this wet clay. And that wet clay actually helps keep the uh, eggs moisturized. Wow. So let's dive back into the threats. You said that, you know, the nesting habitat has changed over time. What's going on? So this complex grass herb structure that the salamanders need to protect their eggs has largely disappeared from the majority of these breeding ponds. Uh, the reason is uh, this vegetation community needs regular early summer fires in order to persist. If you don't have fires regularly burning continuously from the uplands into these dry pond basins, you'll get shrubs growing up where we're sitting right now it'll shade all of this out and then the leaf litter will start to accumulate all this vegetation will die flatwood salamander has nowhere to lay its eggs an organic layer formed by decaying leaves and grasses it uh, basically seals off the ground from the eggs and so the eggs um, can't uh, stay properly hydrated this is the first time i've ever heard organic being a bad thing wow <laughs> it's kind of interesting when i stop and think about this um just how you know, we talk time and time again about the importance of an open canopy of lush, herbaceous ground cover. And how interesting is it that we're in a wetland, not the uplands, and yet the same kind of factors are at play. That's, That's right. So, interesting. so uh, not only do you need fire, you need fire at the right time of year to keep the nesting habitat suitable for flatwood salamanders. So a lot of the prescribed fire programs on our conservation lands um, focus on burning in the dormant season or during the winter. And most of the time, these ponds are full of water during the winter. And so the fires would stop at the edge of the wetland and this would not get burned off like it needs to maintain gotcha. its structure. Natural fires are probably ignited in the early summer by uh, lightning uh, during afternoon thunderstorms. And these only go dry in the early summer and in the fall. And by then the salamanders, I assume, have moved into the water or underground, someplace where they're safe. That's right, yeah. In the early summer, all the salamanders are underground. Fire okay. does not affect them at all. So I was picturing a bunch of like roasted salamanders <laughs> just laying, waiting, waiting to die, but that's not the case. Well, so going back to the eggs, I mean, you find these eggs, you're not collecting them, are you? The original plan was to just collect a small subset or percentage of the eggs we located in order to head start them, give them a, a boost on the probability of survival, and we would return them here once oh, okay. the larvae had matured to, to metamorphs. Uh, the past few years, we have had um, winter droughts, and so all of the eggs you, you see here would have desiccated and died had we not intervened. Wow. So all these eggs would have died. That's right. There are so few salamanders left that we can't afford to have any uh, bust years. We're kind of like at the last stage of this conservation story with this species. Yep. Seems like. This is a make or break moment. Wow. Well, the work you're doing here is really important. I mean, you mentioned restoration of the ponds. Now, is this an example of that or is there someplace we can go to kind of see that in action? Yeah, this is a restored pond, but yeah, let's go see a pond undergoing restoration. Okay, cool. Let's do it. So Peter, I brought you to this spot because it tells the full ecological story of what's wrong with the salamander ponds and what we're actually trying to do to remedy those problems. So if we look over here, 
this pond is in the process of being restored. And so our partners with the Forest Service are sending in crews with tools, chainsaws, machetes, and herbicides, and they actually cut out the entire mid-story and thin the overstory, drag it into uplands, pile it up, and those piles will eventually burn away with the next prescribed fire. And do you have certain standards for how you're cutting down those trees? Right, yeah, so uh, certain size classes of trees are removed and certain species of trees are removed. So we target problem species like hollies, tai tai, black gums, and we leave most of the cypresses. Wow, well Pearson, that looks really great. I mean, there's a lot of piles. I can't imagine doing that work. That's crazy. Wow. So behind us here is what a uh, thermal pond looks like after decades of fire suppression. So due oh, to the God. prevalence of dormant or winter season burning, fire hasn't been able to enter that. And the shrub layer has become so thick, you can't even set that on fire if you wanted to. That looks like just a wall of hell. I'm not going in there. I'm just letting you know right now. I am not doing that. It's pretty horrible. Are you really making a dent? We've got a, uh, a long way to go to bring the salamander habitat back to how it was historically, but uh, we've restored well over 100 breeding ponds in wow. the past five years. So we're hoping that the salamander populations can respond. So I've got a treat for you, Peter. Today we'll be releasing one of our baby head started flatwood salamanders. Oh my gosh. So this little guy, just a few days ago, was a gilled aquatic larva. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. He was just basically a tadpole a few days ago. My heart. <laughs> He's absorbed his gills and is now breathing air. How many of these do you have? So this season, we salvaged almost 1,400 eggs. All of those eggs would have died due to the winter drought. We were able to donate uh, several hundred of them to zoos to hopefully captive breed them. Uh, we hatched out almost a thousand eggs ourselves into 75 300 gallon cattle tanks. Wow. And we were able to raise um, almost 900 of these to metamorphosis. And so uh, that's a, a survival percentage of almost 85, 90%. In the wild, we think it's less than 10%. And you're releasing all those? And we released them all. And so hopefully they'll return a couple years from now as adults and contribute to the breeding population. How do you kind of let them go? We typically tuck them into moist situations. So we find a good log like this one right here. Moist situation. And uh, we know they like to live underground in burrows. So we find a suitable burrow, uh, such as these crayfish burrows right here in front of us. And then we just choose one and we tuck them down in. Wow. Oh my gosh. The work you're doing here is just Phenomenal. I mean, you're literally bringing the species back. This whole project, restoring these wetlands, isn't just about the flatwood salamander. The flatwood salamander is just the most sensitive member of this pond community. If you manage for the flatwood salamander, you're also saving an entire suite of amphibians, reptiles, and rare and endangered plants. What this whole story of the flatwood salamander really indicates is that if you can save something with needs as specific and specialized as this animal, think about what else you can do in the longleaf pine ecosystem. I mean, we're saving this, we could save other species, and we can save the ecosystem as a whole. To me, this little fella right here illustrates hope, and I'm filled with it right now, and I really appreciate the work you're doing, Pearson. This is, doesn't get much cooler than this. Yeah, no problem. Man, that's so cool. Wild Wander is made possible by the generous support of organizations that believe in the importance of the stories we tell. If your organization would like to talk about a partnership opportunity, contact us at info at macroscopepictures.com.